Hi, my name is John Trenchard. I'm from Arbor Venture Training. Uh, we're here today to do some rope inspection uh, with Turfelberger ropes, just making sure that your ropes are in good condition for you to climb on them safely. So the first place we're going to start inspecting our rope is looking at the label. The reason we're looking at the label is we need to work out the age of the rope uh, and see how old it is. Most ropes, when they're in a working environment, their working life is about five years. So we need to know how long this rope has been in service, when it was manufactured, uh, to know that it's not too old to work on. Uh, what Turfelberger will do is give a maximum age in, uh, of, of their ropes of uh, eight years uh, with five years on the job. So you're just using your rope at work every five years and then you'd retire it. That's the maximum lifespan of that rope. Um, ropes can be retired earlier. There might be certain situations. You might accidentally cut the rope. There might be some con contamination with the rope. Uh, UV light is our main enemy with our ropes, along with dirt, debris, and particularly sand. So if the rope is very contaminated, you may feel that you want to retire your rope earlier, and that's not a bad idea. The rope is your lifeline. Yeah? So that's one of the reasons we're making sure that we're doing a thorough inspection of our rope. So ascertain the age, we're going to look closely at the label. So when your ropes come supplied, they will usually have the rope shrink wrapped, uh, labeled, placed at the end of the rope. There'll be one at the top and one at the bottom end. And that label contains some information. It tells me the standard it was tested to, and it also tells me the manufacturing uh, date and year. So this particular one I'm looking at is 1912 and then there's a random serial number at the end of it. Now this tells me the year of manufacture, so it's 2019. So that's the bit I'm most interested in. Labels come in different styles. This is traditional shrink wrap type. They could be stuck on. Now this label perhaps you can remove and you can keep somewhere safe because it's not gonna last very long in a working environment. And what's not a bad idea is when you get your rope from new, is to take the, the label off the bottom of the rope with a short portion of the rope and this helps to identify the rope, the age and the label and so you've got that to keep with your records then you know how long the rope's been uh, used for. So cut the small piece off, some tape around it, pair of scissors, flash the end over with a lighter so that it doesn't flare out and then that is a useful thing to keep with your, your records. Um, some ropes you may have lost the label already, may have gone and you want to know the age of the rope. So all Turfelberger ropes, per, they put a tracer inside. So if you're not sure how old your rope is, you can, you can flip, flop open a bit from the bottom and this will reveal where the tracer is. You can pull the tracer out and inside it will tell you the EN number it was tested to, what it's constructed of, what it is, and there'll be a manufacturing date on the end of it. And this one is manufactured in 2016. So if there's no other information with this one, we don't know when it started to, to be used. Uh, this has got another year of service life, this particular rope left in it. So we can always find that by pulling out the tracer in the end of the rope. It would just be a case of taping that rope up and sealing it again, uh, and it would be ready and fit to go. So no problem at all with finding the tracer. So we got the tracer in there, we can work out the age. This, the age thing is also very important because different types of rope have different ages on them. Um, we've got a friction cord here, this is a, an ocean polyester. And if you look at the user instructions, always a good idea to have the user instructions and have a read through and it will tell you the service life of all of your different types of ropes and all the information I'm giving you is found in these books anyway. You can have a look through there and it tells you that this particular rope, because of the aramid fibres in it, which don't like UV light, needs to re be retired after three years in service. So it's a friction cord, it's subject to high levels of wear, but the maximum you're going to get out of that before you need to retire it is three years. We've got another rope here, this is an Ocean Dyneema, and again, because of the fibres that are inside, the service life of this little fella is at two years before we need to replace it. So not everything is five years. Ropes have different ages on them depending on the fibres that are used to, to con, uh, in their construction. So always check the books. Um, good information in there and it will tell you the service life, maintenance and all the other information that you need to have. Okay, so after we've checked the labels to know that the rope's uh, within age, the next thing we're going to do is look at the end terminations. Just need to understand a little bit about the end terminations and how they're formed because they're, they're made in different ways. Um, what we've got here is a, a slice, 
So we've got a Dyneema insert inside the rope, folded back over and stitched up. Here we've got a splife. So this is moving towards a more traditional type of splice where there's a portion of the core involved in the cover and it's fed back inside and then there's some whipping there. This is a traditional double blade, spl uh, double, uh, braid splice where the rope is the same diameter all the way around and fed back inside and the splice carries on down to approximately where my fingers are at this end. We got a 16 strand rope so the core has been removed, the rope has been folded over and fed back in, in this case into a uh, slice again and then a stitched eye. So if you're checking the, the stitching on any of these, particularly the slice and the stitched eyes, you're looking for making sure that the, the the, the resin or the plastic cover is over the top. There are no frays in the stitching. The stitching is good order um, and everything is held as it should be. There's a resin over the top of these stitches to keep them all in place. Same with this one here. And there are no loose threads in any of the stitching that's going on. Then we move into the structure of the rope itself. And we're looking just to move the rope around and just make sure that all the fibers are in, in good place. Uh, everything is as it should feel, so there's no, no cuts or abrasion or any flattening too much going on in this area. So we're checking around the edge of the splice, all feels the same, feels consistent. Yeah, happy with all of those. So once we've checked through the, the end terminations, the next thing we need to do is to move on and check the whole rope. The best thing to check a rope with is by feel. If you run it through your hands, you can feel if there are any um, shapes, any bumps, any lumps inside the rope. You will also feel any cuts, anything that's strange. Your hands are amazing ability, they're very tactile to be able to feel the rope itself. And you can also see by as you're pulling the rope through how dirty perhaps the rope is by what residue it leaves on your hands. So we're looking for a number of things with our ropes. We're looking for cuts. We're looking for broken fibers. We're looking to see any abrasion. Again, how clean it is, any heat damage. Um, so glazing or melted fibers and make sure that, this, that the rope is in good order. Chemical cont uh, contamination. So maybe things like petrol, tree sap, oil that may have got on the ropes some disinfectant perhaps. We're also for looking for flattening and squashed areas. Um, any signs of uh, shock loading, so lumps. And at the end of the rope, we're looking to see if the rope has milked any significant amount. So these are all things we're looking for. And as I go through the rope, if I find any, we'll stop and discuss them. And I've got some examples that I can show you afterwards uh, so we can look at these in a little bit more detail. So lay the rope in my hand and I'm just gonna pull it through. And you, you can get through a fair bit of rope quite quickly. You'll learn the feel of the rope as it's going through your hands. Um, this one feels fine, there we go. Just as I go past my fingers, I've got a few little puffs on that side. So I'm just looking at those. Now, how many cuts should there be in a piece of rope? Well, it's a difficult thing to ascertain and what you're always looking to do is to compare where the rope is damaged to a piece of rope that's undamaged. And I tend to get the rope and make a teardrop and squeeze it together and then get a piece of rope that's undamaged and squeeze it together and I put the damage on the outside that's where the weakest area is going to be and then you can see whether the form is the same and there's no problem with that this is just a little bit of wear and tear maybe a foot ascender maybe something sharp has rubbed against it while it's been working but that's okay don't melt these back in. The temptation is some people get a lighter and flash them over. Don't do that because you can damage your rope. If they're very long, you could carefully snip them off with a pair of scissors, but you're better off not to do anything to them actually. So we're gonna carry on and pull that through our hands. And it's the same process all the way through the rope. And there we go, I found a little bit more damage on this one. So what's going on here? Well. The damage is a bit of the blue fibres and the yellow fibres, blue and yellow gone across there. You can look closely and see how many fibres that is. This is a 32 strand rope and there's probably, there's a fibre gone there, fibre here, about three or four fibres in that area. So it's a bit more damage. Now we're going to do the same test. Damage to the outside, pinch a teardrop, good bit of rope with no damage on it squeeze them together and you can see this one is just going a little bit tighter than this one. So it's not at a stage where if it was flattened off completely then it would be a retirement. 
if it's um, you know if it's in that sort of area then again we can monitor this this will probably go down on my list as something to monitor or the climber to monitor while they're using this rope but again that is getting close to being a retirement but at the moment it's still fine so I'd be happy to carry on using that piece of rope. So we're continuing to feed the whole rope through your hands and as I said um, they're the most useful tools for checking ropes. You will feel things long before you see them. This is when you want a, a nice 30 meter rope and not a 60 meter rope but it's important that you keep consistent the same speed the same feel and you just notice anything coming along that needs to be uh, inspected more thoroughly. Now I'm getting towards the end of the rope now because I can feel the ropes a little bit more tactile. Not been used quite so much as the, the top third, this is quite normal. And the colours are a bit brighter, it's quite normal what you'll find in your rope. So I haven't found any other damage in the rope as I've been going through and as I come towards the end I'll find, which is quite common in a double braid rope, a bit of milking. Now this is just where the rope has settled down. It's not a major problem with the rope, it's, all, it's probably a little bit of inconvenience. And what you don't want to be doing obviously is climbing on this because all this means is that the, the outer sheath has stretched and moved the long inner core and all we've got here is potentially half the rope. A double braid rope is a rope on rope. 50% of the strength is in the outer, 50% is on the inner. We've lost the inner, so at this stage the best thing to do again is to get our electrical tape out, tape it off tightly, and then a pair of sharp scissors, cut through the rope, and then just flash over the fibres on the end to make sure they don't fluff out. And then monitor it. It's quite normal for a double braid rope to milk during its life, um, depending on how it was made, when it was made, depends how much milking you get from the end of your rope. So we're going to look a bit more closely now at specific damage to ropes. Uh, this is a rope I was inspecting earlier on and I found some signs of abrasion. So abrasion is where a number of fibres in a given area have been in contact with something that's caused some damage. Could be, it could be a foot ascender has dragged up and down there a few times, it could be uh, the side of a chainsaw or a handsaw, it could have been where the rope was dry crutched in the top of the tree and has been moved backwards and forwards in the same area. Um, again, the same test as we did for the teardrop test with the cut really is we'd pinch it together and we'd see how much damage in that area of abrasion against an area of, of good rope and there isn't much in it. So again, it's something just to monitor and something to keep your eyes on. So let's look at some of those other damage areas uh, on a piece of rope. And this one, we've got an area of glazing. Okay, so we can see that shine in the light. So, the most common thing to cause glazing is probably heat damage. So this could have been rubbed over, um, again, a branch and, and a climb has come down quickly. It could be a friction cord has been worked too hard against it. The climber has come out of the tree too fast. And if that's the case, you'll end up getting damage on your rope. And you will probably see when you inspect your friction cord also uh, severe damage on it. You can see this one has also got a memory and there are signs of damage in there. You can, it's usually a cut, changing colour as well is a good sign as well as the feel. Now the reason glazing is such a problem is that if we continue to use that rope, it's first of all changed the, the condition of the fibres, but it's a bit like a piece of wire. If we just keep rocking it backwards and forwards, which is what happens when we climb, eventually those fibres are going to break down and fatigue in this particular area and cause the rope potentially to fail. The other thing that could cause... Um, glazing or this sort of damage to a rope could be some chemical damage. So never store your ropes with potential of things to contaminate it such as petrol, oil, um, maybe tree sap, um, different areas that if, uh, sap can have different, different uh, effects on the rope itself. So watch out for glazing. If we find this and it was that bad then yes you'd want to retire the rope. So moving along, there's an obvious cut. I mean, hopefully, if anybody saw that end of the rope, there's no way they carry on climbing. You can see all the way through to the core of the rope, that blue core inside. Uh, there's a warning. If you can see that, don't climb on it. Here's more of an, a cut that you're likely to find on a climbing rope. This could happen quite easily with you lifting your chainsaw up to do some work or perhaps your handsaw when you're moving it from side to side and you just catch the edge of your rope. So again, 
we've got a few fibers cut in that area there and it's a good example of that teardrop shape how it flattens out so there's significant damage in this area the shape of the rope is gone if we get a, a normal piece of rope next door to it I'll see if I can squeeze it with the same sort of pressure we can see that yeah I've still got a bit of a teardrop inside where this rope potentially flattens out so again that would be a retirement if you found that in your rope itself and here we have another rope um, which, which is ruptured it's pretty obvious that you wouldn't carry on using this rope what has happened is the, the cover has gone it's ruptured and exposed the core of the rope so this is the inside piece so again being a double braid you've got strength on the outside strength on the inside there's nothing left on the outside so hopefully you wouldn't carry on a climb on that rope that's destined for the bin okay so one of the things that's quite difficult to work out in a piece of rope is when an episode has occurred um, you need to know what has gone on with the rope so here we have a nice round area of rope nothing wrong with it but as I feed it through my hands I start to feel some lumps and some bumps and maybe you can see clearly on there you can see some threads have been pulled or something has gone on with that rope now this is often a sign of shock loading if the rope has been subject to uh, a sudden impact maybe somebody took a fall on it maybe somebody borrowed the rope and decided to do some rigging with it it's not a good idea to do that with a piece of PPE but you don't know there's been an, been something happened to this rope that is unusual and the only way you can really tell is to rub your hands along it and to feel in that tactile manner with your fingers and you can feel some lump so if you find this on your rope then that rope needs re to be retired um, because we don't know what has happened to it but there's definitely some lumps and bumps in there that make the rope unusable okay so one other thing to look for on your rope you may find is a bit of flattening we've got an example here this is taken off of a, a tree motion harness and this has been caused by the ring uh, rubbing around the back of the rope but you can sometimes find this in climbing ropes now this is most likely caused where the climbing rope has been left on the ground and somebody has chopped down a piece of wood and you've landed a piece of wood on this and it has impacted over something hard on the ground never a good idea to leave your rope in your drop zone of any timber or anything else coming out of the tree but if you, again if you find flattening with this you can see that if we do that pinch test again it almost flattens out so the fibers are broken down and that's on the inside yeah you can see that those those fibers are gone so that again needs to be retired so one of the best things you can do to your ropes is to keep them clean is to, to wash them on a regular basis what you don't want to do is to wash your ropes in a standard detergent um, tests have shown that about eight washes of the rope in a standard household detergent can reduce the breaking strength by approximately 50%. Uh, Turfelberger recommend their, their own scrubber. Uh, it's a gel that has been tested to be compatible with their ropes. So you can follow the instructions on that of how to wash your ropes. If you can't get hold of any of that, then the best thing to do is just to coil your rope up carefully I place mine into a pillowcase, I put it into the washing machine and then I pack it with other clothes that could be washed as well and wash it on a low temperature. Again the user instructions say to keep that temperature below 30 degrees. Um, it, what it will do is it will get the majority of the, of the dirt away from your ropes and then you want to allow them to dry naturally. So just loop them out into to daylight or loop them in a, in a barn or somewhere they can just air dry don't apply direct heat to your ropes because again that can cause some damage so if you keep your ropes maintained properly you keep them clean um, inspect them on a regular basis um, climbers should always inspect their ropes every day before they go climbing it's your lifeline you want to check it before you go climbing in the UK we have legislation that asks us uh, to check our ropes every six months by a competent person um, so someone else comes in and would check my ropes they would look at it with an objective eye and they would do all the checks that I may do but there might be something that I miss but the most important thing is that we do regular checks to our ropes so I hope you found some of that interesting um, and safe climbing and look after your ropes thank you